Let's do it. This is how you watch Hey, this is how you watch Hey, keeping the faith in the king, and the patience will give us a free. Let's start with Isaiah 9, all right? Make sure you take good notes and stay with me. I want Isaiah 9, and we're going to read 1 through 7, and then we'll go back and start <clears throat> breaking it down a little bit. So Isaiah 9 and 1. Well, we'll stop here and there, but go ahead. The book of Isaiah, chapter 9 and verse 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of the, and the, the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the nation. Right, so it's talking about the judgments that the Most High put on us, all right, and how we would be in darkness, right? We'd be without a king, without an image, right? I'm just kind of summarizing. You would have to read uh, chapter 7 and 8 to really get the detail of it, but we don't need that for today's class, all right? So it says, um, he's talking about the afflictions that Israel will suffer, all right? So come on. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shone. Right? It says, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. Who are the people that walked in darkness? Anybody should be able to just answer this. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and verse 29. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind groweth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. Now, this is the one I was thinking of. That's not the gross darkness one, but this is the one that I was thinking of. And you keep it simple that way because why? Deuteronomy 28 is a basic scripture for us, right? It's a basic scripture for us. So it says the ones that walk in darkness, okay? It says that the blind, we will be like the blind that grow a new name. Meaning, even though we can physically see with our eyes, spiritually we would be dark. So this is prophetic. Isaiah, we're reading a prophecy. It says the people who are Israel that walk in darkness have seen a great light. Come on. Verse 3. Thou hast multiplied the, na the nations and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. So he's saying, listen, you've multiplied the nations, right? When he said that he would send a nation from far against us, we'd go one way against them and flee seven before him, we'd be scattered. It's going into those curses, right? Come on. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of many. So now he's saying... In, when this prophecy comes to pass, okay, because I don't want to give it away. Some of this has come to pass, and some is still yet for a time. He says, you broke the yoke of his burden, meaning Israel, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And that's going into the history in, is it Judges? With Midian and the conquest in, in Midian, all right? Um... I'm trying to remember where it is, in case you guys want to read it. Hold on, let me see. Uh, Judges 7. Read Judges chapter 7, and you'll see about the conquest of Midian. Right? So he's using this as an example, right? Come on, read on. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. He says every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, meaning... In, in these times, in the time of Isaiah, every battle with metal instruments, right, was a confusion of noise, right? Cling, clang. You see movies where they do battle scenes and you hear all that, right? Armor clashing. He says, and garments rolled in blood, right? Because we're slicing and dicing. He says, but this salvation shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Come on, read for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, hmm. and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Read on. Of the increase of his government 
and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. All right. So now let's go back to verse five. All right. We're going to break down five through seven before we get to the title of the class. And this is all relevant to the whole class, so make sure you're taking good notes. All right, Isaiah 9 and 5. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 5. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Hold that in Isaiah 66 and 15. Isaiah 66 and 15. To explain... The burning and fuel of fire. Come on. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire. Right at the end of verse 7, he said, the Lord's zeal will make this happen. The Lord's zeal is to come and give his recompense. Because the scripture says the Lord has been long suffering. He's itching to go. He wants the battle. He's just waiting on us, right? So to us to be sealed. So it says, behold, the Lord will come with fire. Come on. And with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. So it's letting you know that this is talking about the final judgment, right? That the Lord is going to come with that fuel of fire. Come on. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. Now, go back real quick. Let's read Isaiah 9 and 5 again. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. So it's letting you know that that last redemption needs to have this, the revelation of the Lord coming with his sword and with fuel of fire. That's when you see the chariots and everything happening, right? So it says, with fuel of fire, my Bible has a little note, and it says meat. When you read Isaiah 66, it says flesh, meaning the, what's going to fuel the fire is the burning of all those nations that try to stand against them. Get Matthew 4 and 12. St. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 12. Now, when we read verses 1 and 2, right, in Isaiah, it was talking about by Zebulon, by the sea. Verse 2 says a light would come to them in darkness, a great light. Okay? Read this so we can understand that. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. Just like we read in uh, Isaiah 9, verse 1. The prophecy was talking about the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali. Right? Come on. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying. So this is what was being quoted, all right? In Matthew, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 was being quoted. Come on. The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And this is one of those times where it says Christ's actions, and it says the reason he took those actions was so that it might be fulfilled. Remember, I bring this up sometimes where I say, it says this happened so that this may be fulfilled. And it's letting you know that he was there for this reason. Come on. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Come on. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So... Thinking about Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, and what we just read in Matthew, what's the light that came to the people in great darkness? He says that he went to Zebulon and Nephtali to the coast. And it says so that it could be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophets of Isaiah. Um, and he says, the land of Zebulon, the land of the, by the way of the sea, by Jordan, yeah. the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region, the shadow of death, light is sprung up. So them that sat in that region are the people that he's seen right then and there. And this without going to Isaiah, all right? So when it says that he went there so that this could be fulfilled, 
That's how you prove that the light is Christ. Because he's letting go. Because then right after that it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom is at hand. Now that means the light is twofold. So why would he say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand? How is that light? Is it just him? Was he just radiating as he walked through there? The law is light. So it says when the light came to him, right? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. The commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. The commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. So this is why it says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is ahead. Because Christ was coming to do and teach the commandments. So the law, the light, first and foremost, is the laws. But it came in the embodiment of Christ. Right? Get Isaiah 42 and 21. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his right, for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. This is talking about Christ. It says he will magnify the law and make it honorable. Honorable in doing away the sacrifice of dirty jacked up animals and doing the sacrifice of his first creation, right? Putting that up on, on there. So when you go back, read Matthew 4, 16. Now with understanding Isaiah 42, 21 and Proverbs 6, 23, read this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because they were in darkness. Why? Sure. Sure. They were cut off from our Israel. They weren't uh, keeping the commandments. They weren't keeping the commandments. All right? When you're, when you're strangers to the covenant, when you're strangers to the law, you're living in death. Right? So they were in darkness. Christ came as the magnification of the law to make the law honorable and he was that light which is why the prophecy says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand let's go back to Isaiah 9 and read 1 and 2 again Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 I want to say, Christ is many things and I think too much of us gets hung up on just the savior piece but not the way he gets there not the way he got there to show it to us we just talk about the miracles. We talk about all these other things. Not understanding the levels to understanding everything that Christ represents. Right? And when you pair that with what we learned about the creation, and he's known as wisdom, and without him was nothing made and everything, it, it, it becomes bigger than just a man that bled on a cross. And that's the part that, because Christianity is hung up on that. This is why they have the the the, um, the, the, idol, the, the idol of the crucifixion. Uh, obviously, not the right image of Christ and all of that. So it's important that you understand how many things Christ represents, so that you can come to that fullness. Right? There's another scripture that talks about coming into the fullness, the full stature, to grow up into Christ. There's levels to it in understanding that. So there's many ways that we approach it, and it's it. The thing is, yes, the answer is usually the laws of Christ, but you need to be able to articulate it. Because it's a cop-out to just say that and not have anything behind it. Then you're just like every other Christian pastor. You're like any other member of the Christian church that can't articulate that stuff for you. And they'll take you to scriptures like John 3, 16, right? And tell you that he's love and all of that. You got to be able to dissect these things and be able to articulate. I'm not saying you go into this on the street, but if you have some upgrades and you go into an engaged dialogue, you need to be able to break these things down, right? So read uh, Isaiah 9, 1 and 2. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. This prophecy is twofold. It's letting you know that in the time that Christ was there, it wasn't as heavy as a darkness. Right? And just for the sake of time, 
you remember John 4 with the lady by the well? She knew that her forefathers were Israelites, right? She says that our fathers prayed in these mountains, right? In Samaria. The grosser darkness that comes after is that we just didn't remember who we were at all, right? So it's letting you know it's dealing with his first coming, what you see in the New Testament. And then it's also because Isaiah 9 is addressing both. His first coming and his second when it talks about how he's going to come and plead with fuel of fire and everything else, right? So it's telling you that it was, it was a light affliction up to that point, and the affliction got heavier. Again, going back to the class I gave a few weeks ago in Matthew when he says, we said the modern day slavery was the beginning of times like you've never seen before, right? Up until that time. So that, it was worse. There were captivities, there was everything. That's when it started worse, right? Read on, verse two. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them have the light shined. Right, because we were dead to the laws, we were dead to the covenants. Even more so, in these last days, it was worse than then. Remember, they had Moses in every synagogue. Acts 15, People think the disputation was telling them not to keep the laws. He was saying, no, focus on the things that they're heavy on. The laws were prevalent. You were able to get that anywhere. And it was understood that that's what you should be doing. What was lacking was particularly in different cities, certain things that they were missing. In these last days, we didn't have the laws anywhere. We had people telling us by precept of men how to live and follow the scriptures, right? So it's worse. He says a more grievous affliction. More grievously afflicted, by the way. All right? Now, jump to verse 6, okay? Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Unto us. Not the whole world. Not everybody. The topic here is Israel. It's talking about Zebulon and Naphtali up front. When you read from chapter 7 and chapter 8, it's talking about Israel. So the us is talking about Israelites. He says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Come on. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. So he's coming with fire and flames, but then they call him the Prince of Peace. So is that like a contradiction? No. Isaiah 66 and 22. Isaiah 66 and verse 22. Peace comes after the conquest is accomplished. That's when peace comes. That's when he will be named the Prince of Peace. Because we understand, he had said it out of his own mouth, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. Come on. Shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. No more gross darkness. No more grievous darkness. Your seed and your name shall remain. We will not be forgotten again. Come on. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, and we will continue to keep the new moons and the Sabbaths in the kingdom. Come on. Shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Read on. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die. Neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be in a abhorring unto all flesh. We read in verse 5, the fuel of fire. I gave you the little note that it says it's talking about flesh, meat. Isaiah 66 earlier, the fuel of the fire will be flesh. It says, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed. That's talking about Israel that's rebellious and the other nations, all right? And it says, for their worms shall not die, meaning the bodies will not decay away. It's going to be a spiritual prayer, because if something burns long enough, cremation, whatever, it turns to ash. He says, no, not these bodies. He said, and the fire will not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. That's how he's going to maintain peace, because there's going to be a constant reminder of the destruction. So you want to talk about never forget? This is never forget. All right? They tell you never forget the Holocaust. Never, you, they are going to, this is why verse 23 starts with they're all going to come to worship before him. And the reason they're going to continue to do that is because he's leaving a reminder 
right? So you know, you had like, um, what's the movie, the, the Dracula movie that came out and they show you with the pikes on the head. You know that was a custom where they would put pikes on the head. This is a similar type of thing psychologically to the other nations. And that's going to be set up in the kingdom. And it says the fire is going to be burning forever. There will be a constant reminder. You're going to see the smoldering and everything of this side of the world as a constant reminder so nobody else would. And that's going to create peace. Because they're going to constantly have that in front of them and say, just in case we forgot, we ain't rolling like that. All right? Now, let's go back. I say a 9 and 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. 1 Corinthians 15 and 24. We're going to be jumping back and forth a little bit between Isaiah. 1 Corinthians 15, start at 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So when someone tries to tell you, and you got pastors like T.D. Jakes and, and Juanita Bynum and them telling you that Christ is coming to set the United Nations in order, this is just a, yet another example of how these people do not read the scriptures. Because this scripture here says, when Christ comes, right, he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, and he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, right? Meaning, not that he's going to give up his power, but he's going to put down all, we understand heaven is rulership, so when it says the kingdoms, it means the existing kingdoms cannot be in power. Read the next verse. For he must reign. For Christ must reign. For Christ must reign. So all governments have to come down. This is why it says the government will be on his shoulder. You must read the whole Bible. You must understand the whole scriptures to articulate this. Because... Christians with their love doctrine will trip all of you up with that stuff. And if you don't have these scriptures in your mind, you'll actually start nodding your head. And inside, you might be disagreeing, but why the hell are you doing this as they talking? Some of y'all do that. These scoffers come up to the camp and they're like this. You should make a conscious effort to do like this as they talk. It discourages them too, because when they see this, that's positive affirmation. So if you sit there and they talk it back to you and you know you're going to come with a cut anyway, just be like this. <laughs> Give me the scripture. And that's it. You're going to take the courage out of them. Right? We give signals off and you don't realize it. In your head you're saying one thing, but you're like, oh yeah, do something good. Because you remember how it was when you was in your church with that pastor. You know, right. you know what I'm talking about. Right. Right, again? Right. You know what I'm <laughs> right. Read verse 24 again. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. You know that's going to be violent. They ain't giving up their power and their rulership and their kingdom. This is why verse 5, wretches war. And it says and, and the, the war that you know is noise, confusion of noise, clanging of steel and, and armor. He says, but this is going to be just straight fire that's going to smolder forever. And the reason behind it, come on. For he must reign till he had put all enemies under his feet. He has to reign until he put all enemies under his feet. And then he'll be called the Prince of Peace after that because he will have brought peace. Right? Come on. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And then the last enemy is death. because at, So it's telling you, immortality, the kingdom of heaven, our rightful place in this earth that was created for all of us, will not happen until all kingdoms and rulership is brought down right. under Christ's authority. Right? This is what it means. The government will rest on his shoulder. The government will rest on his shoulder. He's the wonderful counselor. 
right? We went over a whole class on counsel. So, so not that I've intentionally been trying to theme my classes together, but there's been things that have come out recently that have, should be able to, if you're studying, help you with each class I've given over the past several weeks, all right? And they all have synergy because the Bible has synergy. I'm telling you, that's not me doing that intentionally. That's the spirit that lets you connect those dots, right? Come on, read. For he had put all things under his feet. He put all things, like Deacon Yowson, under his big black feet. <laughs> when he treads the wine press, come up. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. Come on. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. That God may be all in all. Just letting you know, this goes back to the Elohim and the powers and everything else. After Christ has done all that things, even though he's set up as king, you understand it's that one mind with God. Right? So now, Romans 1.20, when we were talking about the creation, we have the evidence of God with creation. Right? Creation is the evidence that he exists. Right? And all those things around. In the new kingdom... The evidence is going to be abundant because of what? This promise. Death will be conquered. The other nations will be conquered. And there will never be another rising again of that stuff. Right. That will be the new evidence that we go by. And all things will be under God. Right? No government left but God's government. Let's go back to Isaiah 9. Uh, read verse 6 again. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. So now you may wonder why his name was the Mighty God. We went over last week about the Trinity and the blood, the earth, the water, right? He's the Mighty God because of what we just read in 1 Corinthians, because it said then it will be manifest that all authority and power still comes from God. So, so you understand that the Most High even has a set up that you don't see Christ as the God. You're going to understand that it's through God's power that Christ was able to do all those things. Right? right? Come on. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Read. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. So just like it says before, what we read in 1 Corinthians, and it says all those things will be subdued under his feet. And it says, the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There shall be no end to that. That's a kingdom forever and ever and ever. So let's get Daniel 2 and 44 to prove that. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. Which shall the days of these kings, you're reading the themes now, so it's telling you against these other kingdoms, come on. Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. Which shall never be destroyed, come on. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. And it won't be passed to anybody else. No more assimilation. No more losing our identity. Our name will be established forever and so will our seed, come on. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And it will stand forever. Hebrews 12 and 28. You want rulership for a season? You want to be able to live like this is your rest for a season? Go right ahead. I'm, I'm holding out for this thing here. Right? Hebrews 12, 28. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. That's just like we read in Daniel, just like we read in Isaiah, just like we read in Corinthians. A kingdom that shall not be moved. Come on. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Right, because it sounds exciting, right? Everybody's right, excited, right? We hear this and we're like, it's great. So he says, if you believe that, and by your rights and nodding heads and affirmations, right? Sounds good. I believe you believe it. Okay? It says, if we know this, basically, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Understanding what's to come and how that kingdom will be established forever, for us, it says, you should serve him acceptably with reverence and godly fear. 
Right? The next verse says, because God is a consuming fire. Go back to the fire piece. Let me get Hebrews 11, 14. It sounds nice, but I don't think many of us fully embrace and understand what it means to say you stand for the Most High God in Christ as an Israelite. I don't think you really get it. You're asking for a new government. You're asking for things to be different. You are asking for order and structure that has not existed since the beginning of the Garden of, of Eden. Because even under the kings of Israel, there were issues. Solomon had issues. David had issues. Saul had Israel. Right? Those were the greater kings. Then you had the other ones. All had problems. There was always rebellion present. There wasn't always peace. There was always war. All nations didn't bring. Right? There was always something. So understanding that, we should be of this mindset understanding what you're seeking. You are saying that you are a revolutionary. Right. And that you seek a revolution. And not a physical one by our hand, because it will be physical, but by God's hand. But ours begins in the spiritual. Read uh, what I told you to get. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 14. For they, they, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. When you say you're an Israelite, when you say I'm from this tribe, I'm from that tribe, when you say that I keep the commandments, when you say that you stand for this, that, and the other, when you go out and teach others so, you're saying plainly that you seek a country. Because everything in this scripture is contrary to everything in this world. Right. It's treasonous in some ways. Were it not for the scriptures that tell us to obey the powers that be, we would be seen as treason. Right? So, it says you say plainly that you seek a country. Come on. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out. And you know what? It says if you really think about it, knowing that we were made to be immortal and the whole earth and everything was from us. If we had remained mindful of that country from whence they came out, come on, they might have had opportunity to have returned. We probably could have returned a long time ago. But we are not mindful of that. So I say we have to be mindful. It sounds nice. Ooh, that prophecy. Ooh, Christ gonna get him. <laughs> But you gotta be mindful in this walk that you seek a country. Right. You are you are revolutionary. Right. By your mere allegiance to the Most High. So we need to act like it. We need to accept that and be mindful of it. Come on. But now they desire a better country. Now we desire something better than when we had the kingdom. Remember in Acts, he said, when you now return the kingdom again to us? We were in rulership at one time. And he says we would have never lost that if we would have been mindful. But we lost it. He said, and now you're saying I seek a better one. Come on. That is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Because God, for those of us that are not repenting, is ashamed to be called our God. He says, but in that kingdom he will not be ashamed. Come on. For he had prepared for them a city. Because he prepared for us a city. The kingdom of heaven waits for us. Let's go back to Isaiah 9, read 6 and 7 again. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So it says not only is the Christ, the government will be on his shoulder. It says of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And to establish it with judgment and with justice. And here it says forevermore. So you have to understand that not only are you saying you seek a country, 
But when you say you seek a country, do you think it's just everybody doing what the hell they want? Everybody doing what they feel? Everybody murmuring and mumbling about order and structure and how things should be? No, there will be no rebels because rebellion is not peace. So those of you who cannot overcome your spirits that you have of rebellion are going to have an issue. It says it's to be ordered, it's to be established with judgment and with justice. Get me Judges 5 and 11. The book of Judges chapter 5 and verse 11. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts toward the inhabitants of his village in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Right? So it says, even though we're talking about the future kingdom of order, judgment, justice, establishing it, it says in these times and in these places, we must rehearse those righteous acts. We must rehearse that government and that structure. We must rehearse that order and establishing of it. It says when we do these things, then will the people go down to the gates? Because the gates is dealing with rulership, right? Scripture later we're going to bring out, it says, uh, this is why it says you will have judges and officers in all thy gates. I often speak about divine order, and a lot of time it comes up with marriage, household, and everything. Government is the same thing as order. You cannot have one without the other. There is a, that's not called a government then, right? There's a structure, there's a chain of command, there's a way things are done. So why do you think we went through all this, before I reveal the topic of the class, based on what I brought out into this point? As you think about that, pull up righteousness. Where's my pull up right the definition of righteousness that I tell you to pull up? This says we will rehearse the righteous acts. Okay. Make that bigger. Scroll down. It says acting in accord with divine or moral law. So when it says rehearse the righteous acts, it says we will act in accordance with divine or moral law. Right? So what else does it say? Scroll down. Well, uh, well, you got slang, genuine, excellent. Were there any other definitions I told you to look with that? That had to do with righteous? I don't remember. No, it was just this one I told you to do? Okay, all right. So acting in accord with the vinyl moral law. So when it says rehearse the righteous acts, it says that we're going to act in accordance with the vinyl moral law. The law of the Lord is perfect. So the moral and divine law is these scriptures. Daniel of Israel United in Christ. Please subscribe to our YouTube channels. Stay up to date with our latest events, music, and classroom lessons. IUIC plans to continue visiting different countries where this gospel has not been preached before. IUIC needs your help in pushing this truth. So join us, subscribe to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and podcasts, and stay up to date with us.
more information, please visit www.israelunite.org.